Good evening, and welcome to the keynote address of 1989, Reconsidering the Nation and its Alternatives in Central and Eastern Europe. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Mark Kettler, and I am the Postdoctoral Research Associate at the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Whether intentionally or out of habit, European historians often peg 1989 as the end of what is sometimes called the short 20th century. Beginning, in the, uh, beginning with the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, this period saw the collapse of European empires, the birth, maturation, and apparent death of fascism, mass violence on an unprecedented scale, communist revolution, and repressive state socialism. As historical periods go, it's a grim one. But with 1989, historians get to end their survey courses on Europe with a moment of uplift. The collapse of socialist autocracies across Central and Eastern Europe seemed to show the promise of broad and inclusive coalitions to overcome entrenched one-party states, of people mobilizing for common political aims, and perhaps even of peaceful revolution. In Poland, solidarity forced the government into roundtable talks and eventually semi-free elections. In cities like Leipzig, throngs of protesters demanded a free country and a free people, and later celebrated national reunification when the Berlin Wall crumbled. For many Central and Eastern Europeans, material conditions have meaningfully improved since the collapse of state socialism. Across the region, societies are undeniably freer. Yet, as we reflect on 1989 today, it is hard to escape the sense that something is amiss that something went awry in the interceding years, perhaps even the sense of promise unfulfilled. The nation today is less often invoked to assert claims of democratic legitimacy and challenge autocratic regimes. Rather, it is cited to justify what Viktor Orban has euphemistically called illiberal democracy in Hungary. In Poland, members and officials of the governing Law and Justice Party have pronounced stark, often vitriolic opposition to Muslim immigration, while simultaneously amending laws to preserve the, quote, good name of the Polish nation by clamping down on discussion of uncomfortable historical realities. In the same regions where East, East Germans once chanted, wir sind das Volk, or we are the people, the members of the Populist Alternative for Germany party have begun to speak in terms of Volksgemeinschaft, a community which notably excises ethnic and religious minorities from the nation. We are left to wonder what exactly happened and why. There are few better situated to comment on these developments than our guest tonight, Jagosh Eckert. Eckert has spent his career studying political movements in Central and Eastern Europe. His work has examined popular mobilization, protests, and opposition to communist rule, as well as the democratization and the host of tectonic political and economic changes which have redefined Eastern Europe since 1989. He is perhaps best known for his influential work on the variant roles of civil society, wherein, wherein he has recently encouraged scholars to critically re-examine the concept in all of its complexity. Civil society organizations, he reminds us, do not automatically bolster liberalism, pluralism, and democratic politics. Eckert's full litany of honors, grants, and awards is much too long to recant here. I can only offer highlights. The Polish Studies Association awarded its biannual prize for best book in Polish studies to his monograph, The State Against Society. His subsequent book, Rebellious Civil Society, earned the American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies Orbis Book Prize. Today, he will bring his wealth of insights to a lecture entitled The Politics of East Central Europe, 30 Years After the Fall of the Berlin Wall. With that, it is my supreme pleasure to present the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Government at Harvard University and the director of the Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies, Jagosh Akert. This was such a nice uh, introduction, Mark, that uh, perhaps we should end here. <laughs> it sounded like a, uh, like a keynote address. Um, it's my honor and, and great pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to Bill and Mark uh, for uh, making me part of this uh, uh, 
really amazing uh, conference. I, uh, um, you know, I, I've been thinking, uh, when was the last time I participated in a, in a conference where so many interesting things uh, were presented uh, in such a great fashion? So, so I'm under great impression, and uh, and uh, you know, I changed what I wanted to say uh, already uh, uh, in order to respond to all the things which uh, uh, which you mentioned. Uh, now. Um, let me let me uh, start uh, with uh, saying that I'm intrigued by four questions. You know, the first question is um, why some transitions in post-communist Europe were initially so successful, despite a very pessimistic expectations at the very beginning. Uh, you probably remember, but you know, when all of this started, the consensus was, you know, those countries are going to have poor democracies and poor economies. Uh, no one is going to succeed after those decades of, of communist uh, uh, oppression. And that pessimistic view was based on really cultural factors. Right? People are talking about Homo Sovieticus, uh, uh, all those suffering and, and, and lack of proper values, uh, experiences, and so on. You know, the paradox I would like to uh, just briefly indicate uh, is that some of those countries succeeded not because of cultural factors, but because of structural factors. And I will expand on this a, a little bit uh, later. Now, the second question I'm, I'm really intrigued is, uh, is why the most successful countries uh, of the region move away from democracy and liberal market economy in the last several years. And this happened despite a very optimistic assumption that those countries did it, made it, um, you know, in a couple of years ago, before peace and urban uh, uh, were started such a mess in the region, everyone was saying, well, you know, it's a boring part of Europe now. Uh, they succeeded. They have good democracies working, and, uh, and there is nothing interesting uh, going to happen over there. Right? How wrong were those people? Now, again, the paradox is that those expectations were based on structural factors, uh, developed economies, good levels of income, not so big equalities, well-developed welfare systems, and so on, uh, while the real causes of this uh, authoritarian turn are purely cultural. So that's the question number uh, two. The question number three uh, is the one which Ron today uh, emphasized so much. Is the experience of Central Europe and its turn away from democracy or move toward populism, a part of the global trend. The same set of factors which animate Brexit, Trump in the US, Erdogan, and all the other unpleasant characters uh, we see on the, on the world stage uh, today. Um, and I tend to think about this that it is not that the causes of authoritarian turn in uh, Eastern Europe are sui generis, and, um, and that uh, they are very different and very specific in comparison to uh, all the other places. Now, the fourth question I'm in intrigued uh, uh, with is, uh, can we really uh, put all the experiences of Central Europe and Eastern Europe into one basket? So this is the question Jacques Rupnik once asked. What Azerbaijan and Czech Republic have in common? Now, I just read uh, a, a, a very nice piece uh, written by uh, Misha Glenny in, uh, in Financial Times, uh, one of those summaries of uh, uh, why we weren't so wrong in 1989 and what happened to Eastern Europe, when he makes just blank statement, you know, all those countries went to the dogs, uh, uh, you know, the gangster capitalism is what prevails in the entire region. Um, you know, for someone who spends a lot of time in the region, it, this is kind of strange uh, comparison. You know, our film, wonderful movie yesterday, uh, sort of 
you know, makes a similar point. Look, that's, you know, Eastern Europe after 30 years. But when you land up in Budapest or Prague on some other places, uh, you don't feel any difference uh, between those places and Berlin or Vienna or some other places, right? So uh, to what extent we can compare, to what extent each of those countries have a, a very uh, a unique uh, story to tell? Um, uh, so these are my four questions, and I will sort of in different moments uh, uh, for the next like half an hour try to uh, highlight some of the uh, ideas. Now, but before before I start talking about Eastern Europe, let me go back to the uh, initial uh, set of ideas Bill had when when he opened uh, uh, the conference uh, uh, yesterday. Now I think that we are living in a in a very difficult uh, moment. Uh, 30 years after 89, 15 years, almost 15 years uh, after European Union enlarged to the east, Europe is in the state of profound and existential crisis. And let me give you a couple of examples. You all know that, but it's good to repeat that from time to time. So we, we really are aware of the gravity of what is going on in Europe. Uh, so for the first time in EU history, uh, an important member state decided to leave the Union. And of course, you know, we've been with this uh, for a long time, and some people say that we are going to be with this for another 15 years or so. Now, for the first time since the Second World War, there is a war on the EU border, and a sovereign country was attacked, and its territory were annexed by another country. I think this is unprecedented uh, in the post-war uh, European uh, history, and uh, Europe uh, is increasingly ill-equipped uh, to deal with this problem. Now, for the first time, uh, a NATO member buys arms from Russia and attacks allies of the US and European countries. That's unprecedented as well. Now, European security is in peril. Transatlantic relations are at the lowest point they probably ever been. There are millions of refugees on the borders of European Union, and there are foreign powers manipulating elections and supporting anti-EU forces. Now, the next point which needs to be emphasized is that liberal European values and the rule of law are under attack, both at home and from outside. EU, for the first time in its history, has a member state which is the authoritarian state. Hungary expelled the Western University from its country. This happens the first time since Nazi era. Abolished the gender studies uh, and women's studies at all Hungarian universities. There are no free media in Hungary. And using the majority, the country manipulated uh, the constitution and the electoral law to make sure that we have one party rule uh, in the country. Now, Poland under peace is moving exactly in the same direction. Now, traditional party systems are falling apart all over Europe. The average age of members of the German old parties is over 60 years. The populist parties are gaining strength across Europe. Nationalists and neo-fascists are marching on the streets of European capitals. Young people are increasingly voting for radical parties of right and left. Just to give you one example, 68 percent of young people in Hungary votes either for Fides or for Jobbik, uh, which is clearly a fascist or neo-fascist party. Now, in Poland, 20% of students 
were voting for the party which are called the United Lunatics uh, and Fascists. This is the coalition of people who want to, for Poland to leave the European Union. They advocate the death penalty. They advocate the white access to arms, want to abolish the old age benefits and all safety regulations. That party receives almost a million and a half votes in Poland a couple of weeks ago, and the strongest group of people who voted for that party were the students. Finally, the supporters of the EU have no vision for the future. They have no compelling arguments for the further integration. EU is being increasingly divided between North and South and West and East. President Macron have just blocked the opening of accession talks with uh, three Balkan countries, precluding any further enlargements of the European Union. And he's pressing everyone very hard, every single country, to change policies vis-a-vis -vis Russia. This is a clear appeasement, uh, appeasement proposition. So Europe is in big trouble uh, wherever you look. And the future of European Union uh, is under big question today. And I think the big part of EU problems lie in the new member states. Uh, so I'm going to move now to, uh, to, uh, to talk about uh, those new member states uh, and uh, talk a little bit um, about the questions I asked um, at the beginning. Right, so the themes of uh, uh, what I'm going to touch upon will be uh, how come that from that liberal moment after 89, we moved to authoritarian reversal. What do we know about this liberal moment, the effects of that liberal moment, and why we missed really the ideas and facts uh, which allow those countries to move in the authoritarian direction. If I have time, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, I would like to talk about uh, a little bit about civil society and democracy and give you some example of civil society in Poland, just to add another argument to the discussion we already have. Uh, who is doing the revolution? Is it from above, from below? Uh, are these elites? Uh, I would like to insist that we have the counter-revolution going on uh, in uh, Central Europe. The counter-revolution which is based on civil society, uh, which form during the last 20 years, providing the foot soldier uh, resources and other things to the elite members who are pushing those countries in authoritarian direction. So civil society is not innocent civil society is part of the problem, and for that matter, a very significant one. Okay, so let's start with, uh, uh, with the first uh, issue, um, namely the question, uh, how come that, uh, 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 what we know about the three decades of uh, transformations in Eastern Europe? Very quickly. First of all, we have extraordinary diversity of outcomes. Uh, what was the former part of the Soviet Union and Soviet-dominated Eastern Europe uh, has all the possible forms of government and all the possible forms of economy, right? This is amazing, and this is, again, going back to the question, can we generalize about this experience? Now, the second thing which is striking about this is the geographic distribution of outcomes. And those outcomes, both political, economic, and social, are distributed along uh, north and south, and west and east. The farther south you go, the worse things uh, become. The farther east you go, the worse uh, uh, things uh, become. Now, for the first initial years of transition, uh, those uh, uh, outcomes were try tend to accumulate uh, in uh, vicious or uh, virtuous circles. So, 
countries which had good democracies had the same time good economic uh, performance. Countries which had terrible democracies had terrible economic system, gangster capitalism, to use the uh, Michel Blaney uh, term. Uh, so that was this initial initial uh, moment where things were moving uh, in, uh, in in very different uh, uh, directions. Then finally, or not yet finally, but then we see the stable path of development. I think uh, this is something interesting about what happens in, in, in the region, that, that groups of countries are moving in parallel ways without any significant uh, convergence. And now finally, what we have is the stagnation of reform, consolidation of authoritarian regimes in places which previously had uh, hybrid regimes like Russia, and then we see backsliding uh, among uh, the democracies uh, uh, which emerge uh, after 89. Just to you know, give you one empirical illustration of uh, what is going on, and I think, uh, so here we have this liberal moment, right? That liberal moment uh, lasted a very short uh, period of time, and different groups of countries capitalize in different ways on this liberal uh, moment. Now, countries of Central Europe uh, made tremendous and very fast transitions, and all the other groups of countries, these are the Balkans, uh, this is Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and these are the countries of Central Asia, never used the opportunity uh, which was given to those countries uh, uh, by 1989 and 91 uh, transitions. And this is that parallel sets of developments uh, which I described earlier, right? Those countries are not, those groups of countries are not converging. They are moving on the separate tracks pretty much uh, uh, side by side for the period of, of, of three decades. So what did make Eastern Europe so successful at the very beginning of the, of the transition? I think that I already uh, uh, made a point that paradoxically, these were structural uh, conditions. So the countries which were successful uh, were, first of all, the best developed countries economically uh, in the region. Right? These were the countries, despite the crisis one or another they had, uh, these were the countries which uh, uh, had the best, the most uh, diversified economies. These were the most affluent countries of the region. And on the top of that, these were the countries with constitutional tradition and countries which had episodes of democratization uh, in the past. Uh, the second structural factor, which was very important uh, for those countries, was proximity to the West. And cultural and other ties those countries enjoyed for the extended uh, period of time, sometimes going back, uh, not decades, but but centuries. Another set of factors which was important for the initial success uh, was attention to social saf safety net and to welfare policies. Uh, there is this myth that um, you know after 89 those countries started to cutting left and right uh, what were the great benefits offered by the communist regimes. This is of course a pure myth. Uh, those countries, the successful countries, rebuilt the welfare system and expanded the welfare systems in very unprecedented way, uh, uh, spending three, four times more than communists were ever spending on any welfare policies. Uh, those countries also had a very efficient, a relatively efficient and effective states, states which are able to regulate uh, and force order and states uh, uh, which were able to prevent, by and large, corruption. Now, of course, you know, someone who looks at Russia and Ukraine and some other countries and oligarchs and all those other things um, uh, has hard time to accept that the level of corruption actually in Poland, Czech Republic, or Slovenia, or, or Hungary were not uh, so dramatic, right? And even if initially there something uh, was going on, uh, 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 those countries were able to deal with this in, in, in a relatively efficient way. And the final factor uh, uh, which I wanted to emphasize, using analogy to Gramsci idea, uh, is the idea of liberal historical bloc. Uh, for whatever reasons, there were no alternatives to liberal ideas uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. One possible answer to that is that this was not a revolution, 
this was implosion of the authoritarian systems. Uh, so there was no long uh, time effort to generate alternatives, come up with, uh, uh, with ideas. Uh, but this liberal uh, uh, historical block uh, was really striking. Uh, the best examples are, you know, the Polish trade unionists who are lobbying government for faster privatization of uh, their enterprises. So everyone believed that liberalism is, uh, uh, is the way to go. Okay, so these are the factors which were important, the structural mostly factors which were important for the initial success of the group of countries which uh, are now the members of the, of the European uh, Union. And something then started to go wrong. Uh, and it didn't start to go wrong in 2008, uh, where the euro experienced difficulties and we had this big financial crisis in, in Europe and so on. Things started to go wrong much earlier, right? Uh, and, uh, and of course, we may have a discussion, uh, when was it that starting point? Uh, but the two countries which led the turn to authoritarian rule were the same two countries which led the, the turn to democratic rule. And I think this is, this is really a big paradox. By 2018, the Freedom House uh, really uh, uh, put this uh, very sad, you know, set of points, right? Uh, in 2008, it registered the highest decline uh, for the region since they started to measure uh, those countries. Poland recorded the largest decline uh, in the history of Serbia. Hungary registered the most uh, profound cumulative decline and so on. Right, so that where things were in 2018. But things started to go wrong much earlier and here we have those, again, scores averages uh, from uh, Freedom House. Uh, these are Central European countries. As you see, the largest decline. Uh, this is uh, Eurasia and the Balkans. But all scores are going down uh, in dramatic ways. Uh, and of course, here we see those two countries uh, where things uh, are the most uh, uh, difficult. This is Poland and uh, this is Hungary. Uh, and the clients are starting in all possible dimensions, right? So it's not only democracy, it's not only civil society, but the electoral process, uh, corruption, and so on. You see the scores from 2008, 13, and 18, and, uh, and they all move in the same direction. Uh, what's even more surprising, uh, uh, those countries have the biggest decline in the free press and free media, right? Poland has the biggest drop again, in probably in history, since they started measuring the declines of, uh, of free media, Poland is now the partially free uh, country in the, when it comes to freedom of media. But you also have Serbia on this list, uh, and Hungary, and uh, Montenegro. So things are really moving with great speed in a very wrong direction. And then Central Europe uh, has become the hotbed of populist uh, uh, parties and, and populist regimes. That's where the biggest trouble for the European Union is not in the western part of the, uh, of the continent, but precisely in the middle uh, of the continent and so on. At this point, uh, many of the countries, uh, not only Poland and Hungary, um, can be classified as uh, not fully democratic. I, there is this uh, measure proposed or set of ideas proposed by my colleagues uh, um, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, uh, which sort of allow to test when the countries are crossing the boundary uh, between democratic performance and, and authoritarian rule. And, and I think uh, you see that here, that uh, weak commitment to democratic rule is the one indicator. In places like Poland, you have clearly constitutional crisis where the branches of government are in state of almost total conflict when uh, governing branch is not uh, accepting the judgment of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the courts and so on and so on. 
there is the question of the legitimization of opposition and of course um, you know for some of you who follow the Polish politics uh, you've heard in the parliament uh, opposition politics being called the scum and, and, and so on then you have the tolerance of violence um, I, I think when you look at the statistics of how uh, uh, much hate crime there is in uh, in various uh, central European countries we see those numbers uh, going up in a uh, quite dramatic way and finally there are attempts to uh, restrict civil rights and uh, media freedom okay so that's what's going on those countries are uh, really uh, way back from where they were in uh, at the beginning at the middle of the transition after five six seven years uh, into into the process so how do we explain that what are the explanations out there uh, to account for, uh, for that situation? Now, the first one, uh, which is the most common one, uh, is uh, this. So populism uh, moves toward authoritarian rule, uh, support for radical parties uh, you see in Europe uh, today are the result of the rebellion of globalization losers and transition losers. Right? These are the groups, parts of population, which were hit hard by both globalization and transition. And the explanation is basically economic one. Right? These are the economic losers. Now, the second one, uh, which uh, shows from time to time, is, uh, is the explanation which really emphasizes uh, the backwardness of uh, those societies, lack of familiarity with, uh, with liberal norms, uh, with liberal traditions. Uh, so, you know, Piotr Stomka talks about civilizational incompetence, uh, and, uh, and um, we could talk about fake Europeanization. Those people really look like Europeans, but in fact, you know, uh, after a few years, we discovered that they are not. Um, the third explanation uh, is uh, uh, explanation advanced by uh, Ron Engelhardt and Pipa Norris. Uh, this is well known, uh, uh, piece I don't uh, need to uh, uh, talk about this, but the idea basically is that we are experiencing silent revolution for the last 30, 40 years, uh, which changes the norms and values of modern societies. And uh, at certain point, those values and norms are becoming so uh, 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 not acceptable to uh, traditional parts of societies that they mobilize uh, against it. And finally, there is something uh, which, uh, which is a sociological point of view, it's a, it's a combination of various factors. Uh, what I want to emphasize in this context is that, that these uh, three classic explanations are uh, uh, what political science uh, say are demand-driven explanation. So parts of electorates are demanding uh, some changes and, uh, and members of elite politicians respond uh, to those demands moving politics in one direction or another direction. But this last explanation really emphasized the supply side of the story as well. Uh, this is in fact the counter-revolution of uh, mostly provincial elites. When you look at the politics in Poland, when you under peace, when you look at the politics in, uh, in Hungary uh, under uh, Orban, uh, the provincial elites fail to join the process of the Europeanization of elites. Uh, they didn't have the proper education, they didn't know languages, they didn't uh, uh, have proper skills. Uh, they felt victimized by the process of transition. But these are not the victims we usually have in mind. These are very rich victims. Affluent, driving expensive cars, having stores, having small enterprises, and so on. These are the real uh, victims of the transition. Now, I already emphasized that most explanations which make sense in this context are explanations uh, which really focus on cultural factors. And let me give you one example just to dispel the idea that uh, there is something uh, economically wrong, uh, at least with those two countries, uh, uh, which produce that you know, resistance toward uh, uh, liberal democracy. Now, Poland uh, is one of the most amazing economic success stories of modern age. 
This is the country which for the last 30 years had one of the fifth highest growing economies in the world. Uh, the inequalities in Poland are lower than in Germany. The poverty level is in the single digit. And you see, you know, this is 2005, 14, how big drops uh, the country was able to produce uh, fighting poverty. This is a per capita uh, 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 national product of Poland, which skyrocketed over the same period of time. You know, Poland will be in 10, 15 years Consider one of the tigers next to Korea and Taiwan in stories about how you can generate successful economic development. But, you know, sometimes people say, well, you know, look, these are numbers, right? Uh, uh, what is important is what people feel, right? Not, not the numbers. Uh, and people feel exactly the same, right? So here is the question asked by... Uh, by the uh, public opinion outfit in Poland uh, uh, since 92. What's the situation of your family? How are your living standards? Are they good? Are they bad? Uh, now, in 92, 40% of the population in Poland claimed that their families have terrible living standards and the situation of the family was very bad. Uh, 15 was saying that the situation of the family is relatively good, okay, right? Now look what's going on now in the era of populism, right? 70% of the polls are saying, my economic situation of my family is perfectly okay. Those who say it's not, it's a single digit, right? Uh, so polls know that they have incredible success in economic dimensions, in terms of inequality, uh, and so on, right? So, if this is not an economic story, this is another story, and we didn't tell that story, and we wake up, woke up at a certain point, and says, what the hell is going on in Poland and Hungary? So, let me go quickly uh, through the list of things we missed, right? What were the important things we didn't pay enough attention to. Now, the first important thing we didn't pay attention to was the political cost on roundtable agreements. This is a funny story because roundtable agreements were considered the biggest achievements of former communist countries in moving from authoritarian rule to democracy. This was the model. This was the way this should be done. Right? This was one of the achievements of, of the region. Now, but this was Revolution without retribution. You know, Prime Minister Mazowiecki, thick line, uh, and the idea, we are not going to prosecute the communists because they are communists. If someone committed crime, that person will be prosecuted as an individual, but no group prosecution. A lot of people in the region were extremely unhappy with this, and that made the rule of law one of the main, most important cleavages in the region. Kaczynski, Orban, and others hate rule of law. They think that rule of law was invented to protect the former communist elites from just prosecution. So that's the first thing which we miss and things which have serious consequences. When you listen what current Polish government is saying about the courts and the justice system. This is exactly, this is exactly that story, right? The communists install the independent justice system to protect themselves. And we have to really destroy that uh, system to be able to really prosecute those who, uh, for the, you know, former communist crimes or economic crimes and so on. Now, the second thing which we missed is that, and you know, I, and, and, Many of us uh, uh, should kind of, you know, admit uh, a, a part of guilt in this story, because we were able to convince EU uh, and media worldwide that those East Europeans love democracy, 
you know, they were prosecuted for 40 years and they dreamt about nothing else but having liberal democracy, rule of law, and so on. I will show you in a moment why this is not true at all. But I also wanted to emphasize that these were closed societies. And for the first time after 89, they had the encounter with the other. Right. Now, and that encounter really was very unpleasant because they went to Western Europe. They thought that they are going to be welcomed with open arms and served, you know, breakfast and so on. And they discovered that the Brits and the Germans and the others thought about them that they are only, you know, this much above the Pakistanis and Somalis and so on. Right? Uh, you know, you talk to thousands and millions of Poles who had experience of uh, working in the West. And they all felt, uh, you know, not respected at all. So this encounter with the other was, was really not what they imagined it to be. Uh, and of course, the fears of immigrants is, is another story, the other part of the encounter uh, with the other. Now, what we overestimated is the power of institutions. You know, we political scientists believed for a long time that if you design the right institutions, which provide the right set of incentives and the right set of constraints, people will behave the right way. So the famous discussion, do you need Democrats to have democracy? No, you need to have the right institutions and everyone will behave like a Democrat. Of course, this was completely wrong and Bosnia is the best example of it, right? This is the most incredible case of construction of institutions which are supposed to keep the country together which produce completely opposite effect, right? So that's another thing which, which, really, uh, 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 which, which we really uh, missed. Now, what else we missed? We missed the fact that people need some stability in their lives. You know, this was a permanent revolution. The last 30 years in places like Poland and others are the 30 years of permanent revolution. First was, you know, defeating the communist system, then building democracy, then building market economy, then joining the EU. You know, joining the EU was tremendous institutional revolution. There were millions of legal institutional uh, elements to the process which put those societies really upside down. And now we are dismantling all of that, right? Uh, uh, what we was built uh, in the last 30 years. So the level of anxiety uh, in the societies is just tremendous. And this is not the poor people. I mean, the research, sociological research on entrepreneurs in Poland, people who are the success story of the transition, tells us that they are anxious, nervous about what's going to happen tomorrow because they have no way to predict any stability in, in coming years, right? So that was, uh, that was the, uh, the, the thing we missed. Let me give this, uh, you, this illustration about, uh, uh, about enthusiasm for democracy, right? So these are the results of EU accession referendum, uh, constitutional referendum if country had one, uh, and the first democratic elections uh, uh, which happened in this country. And let's take the example of Poland, right? So, you know, only 58% of people participated in EU accession referendum, despite, you know, these pro-European attitudes. And out of this, 77% uh, voted for accession, right? So 30% of them did not vote for accession. That means that less than half of the adult population in Poland either didn't care about EU or didn't want to join EU. Now, this is that, this is that electorate of, of Kaczynski party. But look at the constitutional referendum. This was a first democratic constitution in the country in many decades. 
only 42% show up to participate in this referendum, and only 53% voted for democratic constitution. What does it mean? 20% of Poles supported truly liberal democratic constitution, right? So that's, and that's, you know, you look at Hungary, you look at other places, uh, is uh, pretty much the same story. Now, okay, let's go farther. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm listing all those things and I'm so happy that the entire day, many of you were pointing exactly to those things uh, which we missed and you are doing research exactly on those things uh, uh, which, which we missed. Now, so what are the other couple of things uh, uh, which are important? Now, when someone at the very beginning of transition uh, had the idea that those countries uh, were sort of frozen in time by the communist system, uh, that person was ridiculed like, I don't you know, freezer idea, what a crazy thing. Right? But from the 30 years perspective, now we know that this was not such a crazy thing. Now, those countries missed tremendous cultural modernization of the West. It took several decades in Western Europe uh, where people experienced cultural change. Acceptance of others, acceptance of women, acceptance of gender differences, um, acceptance of many liberal values. Those societies in Eastern Europe did not go through this. No one was discussing, you know, liberal ideas and human rights and so on and so on, except a bunch, small bunch of uh, intellectuals. What, what was there were ultra-conservative churches, pre-war ideas and phobias, and very peripheral mentalities. Now, this was the lag between material and cultural modernization, which was really striking. So then some people said, look, what happened in 89 was that imposed modernity, that sudden, in a very short period of time, the ideas which were nurtured in Western Europe for half a century were dumped in Eastern Europe. And people didn't like those ideas, really didn't like, right? And the Polish church hated those ideas. So that really is a, is a very important element of the, of the story which needs to be told. Now, the next thing is what I call the emergence of pillarized civil society. And that uh, uh, is the story of uh, having two civil societies in one place. In every single country of the region, we now have two civil societies side by side. One which is liberal, progressive, and one which is very conservative, very traditional. Now, that's the foundation for political polarization, that's the foundation for cultural polarization, and that's one element which is common to many countries uh, like the US. If you think where Trump is coming from, go back to 1960s and 70s and look for moral majority. These are the people which started to organize on the local level, started to raise money, build foundations, build media networks. Uh, in the 1980s, they were able to fully manipulate the primaries and the local elections. And in the 2000s, they elected Trump, right? That's that's what it is about uh, uh, divided, uh, pillarized uh, civil society. And finally, you know, there's another story which, uh, which is very important. There are unresolved historical traumas in the region. Again, the French, the Germans, uh, and others were discussing for the last half a century what they did during the war. These discussions were not full, you know, not comprehensive. We can complain about this and so on and so on. But there were real debates and discussion about those things among historians, among uh, commentators and so on. People in Poland or Hungary never discussed uh, different interpretations of World War II, uh, never had debate about Holocaust, 
genocides, communist takeover. Now, when Jan Gross's book showed up in Poland, this was a total shock. Poles couldn't believe it. They thought that they were, you know, the righteous nation, that they protected the Jews uh, during the war. Uh, they didn't want to believe in this. And, um, and so, you know, that's a, a very, uh, very important uh, story as well. Um, now, let me take the last uh, few minutes uh, uh, to, uh, to tell you more about this pillarized civil society which emerged uh, uh, in Poland, uh, because I think this is a really a key to understanding what is going on in Polish politics. Um, I'm not going to bore you with uh, uh, with some other things, uh, but I will uh, quickly move to uh, to that issue of of, uh, of civil society. So you know there, there is this uh, uh, consensus uh, has been in place for uh, for a number of decades that civil society is good. The more of it, the better. Uh, that is why we are spending billions of dollars b building civil societies in various countries and so on. And, you know, uh, uh, Bob Putnam uh, line is just exactly, uh, you know, the story about, uh, about this consensus. Uh, but I think, you know, this is not so clear that uh, a lot of civil society uh, has a good consequences. And uh, let me give you just one example. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is Italy. And uh, the, these are the regions which uh, Bob Putnam studied uh, for the book on democracy. Uh, so, you know, the darker uh, uh, color, the more, uh, the more civic, uh, uh, civic capital and, and more civil society. So here is the northern Italy, a lot of civil capital and, and civil society. And then is the southern uh, Italy, which is, you know, uh, peripheral and, and has very few of that. Uh, now, the circles are the number of fascist uh, organizations uh, uh, in uh, different parts of Italy. So, you know, in this poor civil society place, you have uh, very few fascists. Uh, but in rich civil society places, uh, you have a lot of fascists, right? So that's, you know, is a puzzle uh, which, uh, uh, which I think we uh, uh, people need to uh, come to terms uh, with. Uh, civil society is not always good for democracy, it's not always good for uh, liberal ideas. And the most dangerous, of course, uh, uh, moment is uh, what uh, Philippe Schmitter noted uh, a long time ago, uh, when we have not one, but several civil societies all occupying the same territory and polity and organizing interspersions into communities that are ethnically, linguistically, or culturally different, even exclusive. And that is exactly what has happened uh, in Poland. Uh, now, I will, so we have time for discussion. I will not tell you the entire story, but, uh, but okay. So after two decades of very robust development of liberal civil societies, some other things started to appear uh, uh, in Poland. And those other things were, uh, ideological pillarization, and then what I call re where uh, the Polish state started to uh, control the civil society again. And uh, we are now in the process of moving to recorporatization, uh, where the Polish state wants to deal with their uh, big organization they can control. Now, where those organizations, where this ideological polarization was coming from, why we were counting liberal organization, the Catholic Church in Poland, uh, in stealthy way, organized a lot of association life. So in 98, there were 40,000 organizations uh, uh, around the parishes, and over 2 million people participated in those organizations. Those numbers went up uh, in, in 10 years and now are uh, in much higher numbers. This is the organizational base of a traditional pillar of Polish society. And when you look at the uh, data on participation in uh, civil society activities, uh, you know, by 2015, approximately the same number of people uh, uh, on the religious side 
participate in charity in volunteering as on the on the liberal side. In the meantime, I'm telling you the Polish church story because we are in, uh, in the right place to tell that story. Um, in the meantime, uh, we see uh, very interesting changes uh, in uh, people uh, in, among the Catholics in Poland. So participation in masses uh, is going down in a quite uh, interesting way. Um, but here's even more interesting story. So number of people who take communion when they go to mass almost triple uh, during the same period. What does it mean, really? Uh, I think it means that we see the process of fundamentalization of the Polish uh, Catholic Church. And the part of this organizational life uh, uh, which I described um, uh, is a part of this fundamentalization process. Just one example. If someone goes to church several times a week, that person has 76% probability to be involved in civil society organizations. Right? So more you do it, the more uh, 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 the more involved in civil society uh, uh, life you are. Now, of course, you know, Polish society is polarized uh, in quite dramatic way. Uh, uh, so, you know, just to give you one, uh, uh, one example, uh, you know, almost 90% of people uh, who are on the liberal side uh, are not trusting the Polish television program. On the other hand, 60% of people who are on traditional side don't like the, the only TV station in Poland, uh, which is liberal one, right? So we see that uh, polarization, polarization and polarization going on, and we see the emergence of the new historical block. And I think it is uh, well illustrated by the so here are the members of Polish Episcopat. Here are the members of Polish government. And in the back is the flag of the Polish fascist organization from the pre-war period. This is the, this is the new historical bloc which is replacing the liberal historical bloc which emerged uh, at the beginning of the transition. Now, so I'm going to, I have a few more other things which I'm not going to bore you with, but I want to say uh, 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 one concluding thing. Now, we have been convinced for a long time that the danger to liberal societies come from the top. That these are, you know, the crazy leaders like Trump, like Erdogan, like Orban, like Kaczynski, who are going to destroy our freedom. But I think that this is not the entire truth. These are the demonstrations of far right in Poland. And these are the gatherings of families organized by the Polish Catholic Church. The liberal society is under attack not only from above, but it's also under attack uh, from below. And we need to do more to understand what are the potential consequences uh, of, the situa of this situation. Thank you very much. for an excellent talk. We'd now like to open up uh, to a general question and answer period, a, a general discussion. Uh, we have microphones that, uh, so, so if anybody would just like to gesture, we'll uh, make sure a microphone gets to you. And uh, I see we already have lots of questions already. So uh, we'll try to get every, everybody in. Thank you. So you'll be calling the questions? Or yeah, oh, I, 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 I think you'll okay. do that. Very good. Thank you so much, Professor Ekir, for your fantastic presentation. I enjoyed it really much. And I have the question about the graph that you showed. Uh, it was the graph of Italy uh, showing uh, these bubbles where the civil society showed the larger representation of the fascists as opposed to South Italy with the small bubbles. 
where the representation of the fascist was much lower. And my, uh, what the first thing that occurred in my mind is the question of communication in poor areas. These areas would be connected more poorly than the areas in the developed uh, part of the Italy. So uh, my guess is that this is the question of communication. And that brings me to the second part of my um, question here is, what is the role of internet and online world in uh, fueling the increase of the radical right? And how does it work in, um, within the con context of the civil society? Okay, so these are great questions. I, uh, um, you know, the graph comes from from the work of uh, of a sociologist from Berkeley, uh, Professor Ridley, and um, and um, you know, it's one of those books which kind of challenges Bob Putnam's idea that more of civil society is better. Uh, those ideas are based on sort of, um, you know, neo-Huntingtonian, I call this uh, uh, idea, that there is a mismatch, if there is a mismatch between uh, the mobilized civil society and the capacity of institutions to absorb it, then the civil society uh, uh, can really uh, do a lot of harm to democracy. Um, and I think the Weimar Republic story is, is, is a very important one, and Sherry Berman has written a beautiful uh, paper uh, uh, just, you know, emphasizing um, that point. Now, the dense civil society requires communication, right? So, uh, so I think that the communication is part and parcel of, uh, of, of the strength of, of civil society. So yes, this is not surprising and, uh, and probably you had much less communication in southern, uh, southern uh, Italy than in northern Italy. Now, with the new technologies, uh, uh, the issue is that, uh, that the right-wing organizations, uh, those organizations around uh, Catholic Church, are much more savvy in using technology than the liberal uh, civil society organizations. Part of the story is that those organizations on the right uh, have a higher number of younger people, while organizations of the left uh, uh, have people like me, uh, right? So, um, you know, I, I wanted to show you this photograph, but I don't know where it is. I, I put the photographs of two demonstrations side by side. The demonstration in defense of Polish constitution and judicial system, and uh, and you know all of those people there were my age, and then nationalist manifestation uh, on the other hand, where you know all the people were you know 18, 20, 25, and so on. Uh, so I think you know that's one factor why uh, they use media in, in very savvy way, but also you know they have a lot of people who are very well educated, like in Hungary. I, I think uh, you know Jobbik. Uh, which is the most radical political party, is the most savvy in using new technologies and media and so on. So that's an that's that interesting story, right? So, um, you know, internet uh, can be a tool of liberation, but uh, can be a tool of something else as well, and, and we really have to accept that. Yeah, it's so long. Terrific talk. Really terrific talk. Um, so, pillarization, that's, that's a fantastic idea, but I, maybe I missed it. Why pillarization? The, the, it seems to me a key question would be, I know it's unfair to keep saying go back, go back, go back, and, and what are the first causes of things, but I didn't, I, it, are you saying that it's because certain institutions in Poland, like the church, were kind of mummified already and, and kept very solid during the communist period? Well, how are you explaining that? Mm -hmm. Because that's clearly a tra now a transnational phenomenon. We know it in our own country, right? And it's true in Turkey as well. I can testify to yeah. that. So, what? How? How would you go in, in that direction? Well, okay. So, I mean, you know, that there is a s story which which can be told, right? So, the, the first part of the story is the role of uh, of Poly Polish Catholic Church in Poland, right? So, you know, we have this uh, glorious, all of us, right, glorious vision of how incredible the Polish church was and how amazing uh, for bringing Poland to democracy and so on and so on. Right? Now, this story is only partially true. Uh, you know, when the roundtable agreements were signed, 
the church made deal with the security apparatus, that all the files of priests who were uh, working with the security apparatus were destroyed. Right? This was one of the parts of roundtable negotiations done by church behind the backs of everyone else who was negotiating. So we really don't know, uh, you know, what's the story, the real story of Polish church under the communist rule and how much they cooperated with the regime, how much concessions they were given from the regime and so on. But then came, you know, 89, and as you all emphasized during our discussions, uh, this was not a joyful eruption of anything, this was a period of total confusion in multidimensional ways. There was confusion about you know, economic changes, there was confusion about political changes, there was confusion about everything. At that moment, the best organized group in society, like Poland, well, those young liberals who were trained in the West, who had degrees from you know, Harvard Business School and, and, and Western universities and so on, um, and had ideas what to do, right? So this liberal core was organized first. And then it took some time for others uh, to, uh, uh, to really to organize. And make no mistake, I think, you know, there's a lot of people who didn't like the European Union, who didn't like democracy, who didn't like all the liberal ideas, but they were laying low because, you know, there were no organizational capacity to do anything about this. And the first moment, the first opening came during that discussion of the Polish Constitution, which I, uh, which I showed you, right? The Polish Catholic Church demanded that the, in the preamble, in the Constitution, there will be a clear statement that Polish is a Catholic nation and that God is above anything else. And the liberals and former communists who were at that time ruling Poland said, forget it, right? So this constitutional referendum would fail because the campaign organized by the church against the constitution was so powerful that what saved it, right, this few percentage votes was the Wojtyla, the Pope, issued a statement that Poland is part of Europe, democracy should be protected, and people should vote for that constitution against, you know, the Polish, the Polish episcopal. But this was the moment where all the organizational activities started because they realized that if they don't have resources, if they don't have think tanks, if they don't have um, you know, uh, media, if they don't have uh, communication capacities and so on, they are doomed, right? So this is the moment, right? This is the moment. And so, so the constitution presented one opportunity. After that, we have lots of organizational activities. All the foundations are in place. Uh, the, the first radio program, the film television program, and so on. And then the second opportunity was the, the, uh, the debate about accession uh, in early 2000, right? Because this was the moment uh, which, again, created a lot of uncertainty and the entrepreneurs were scaring people to death, right? So, you know, the Germans will come and buy all the land in Poland, um, you know, this sort of things, right? So in, you see this dramatic decline in support for the EU, for democracy, exactly during that period. And after that, uh, the, the set of organizations was fully in display. Now, what happened in the, in the late 2000s was legitimization of far-right and neo-fascist organizations. And that's, you know, in which the Kaczynski government the first one in 2005, 2007, and the current one has a big hand, right? They are supporting those organizations, legitimizing those organizations, uh, providing resources to those organizations. Uh, they instructed the Polish state enterprises, you know, Poland has gigantic state sector, that they cannot advertise anything in liberal media. All the advertising goes to far-right, conservative, and Christian newspapers, television stations, radio stations. So and these are billions and billions of, of, of dollars, really, which go into maintaining that second pillar of, uh, of suicide. So, you know, there is a story, right? And, and you know, the, the story about, uh, we've heard today, right, about uh, Arcana uh, in Poland, uh, about Slovakia, right? That's exactly step by step, you know, long process. 
yeah, you just offered an explanation of what the earlier you uh, denied you wanted to claim the bottom up, uh, right? The disenchantment uh, is bottom up, but here you were talking about media manipulation, right? Uh, so I want to go to that and your idea of the two civil societies. So that made me very uncomfortable. Uh, because the idea of differentiation is human. All groups are constantly involved in differentiation. The question is why this results here today in polarization of such a sort that you want to even claim they're totally autonomous, separate, they have nothing to do with each other. But I always said the two Germanys were one society. It's simply they were involved in this process. In the 1930s, Gregory Bateson defined it as schizogenesis and really took his, uh, his uh, example out of marriage, where a couple simply all of a sudden, you know, is kind of indisputably, and they can't, they can't agree on anything. My point is that, that these divisions within society today are weaponized, yeah. and the means to weaponize them didn't exist before, although they've always existed. So today, you don't have to be on the streets to weaponize or engage in violent activity against your enemy from home, you can be informed and be mobilized emotionally and whatnot. So, you know, I would think around the idea of two civil societies, I, it makes me... Well, I, I mean, yeah. you know, you, you are right that uh, at, at this point those divisions are, are uh, weaponized, but the idea of pillarized civil society is not the new one, right? Uh, so it goes back uh, to the Netherlands, uh, uh, where in the end of 19th century, the socialist and Catholic communities started to organize, producing exactly, you know, the, 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 the idea of the name of pillarized society, civil society comes from that, uh, from that experience, where, you know, you had a, a, a completely separate silos, uh, starting from the political party, uh, representing that community going all the way down uh, through trade unions, uh, choral societies, youth organizations, burial, um, um, you know, organizations, and so on and so on, right? Uh, so that's, that's one example. Now, the, the second example is Lebanon. I, I had a student who, uh, you know, the French, in order to deal with diversity uh, of religious, uh, ethnic and religious in, in, in Lebanon, came up with the idea before the war uh, to say, okay, let's every community govern itself. And then we'll at the top sort of, you know, coordinate uh, this. Uh, and that's, you know, how the pillarized civil society in Lebanon emerged. And, uh, and I had a student many years ago who uh, told me the following story. He w belonged to one of the, the Christian, you know, pillars of, of the civil society. He said, the first person, uh, you know, let me make a preface, Lebanon is, is a, you know, a country the size of, I don't know, New York or something, right? So it's a really small, small piece of territory. He said, the person with whom I had a longer conversation from another pillar for the first time was when I was 16. So his entire life, from the kindergarten, through the school, through high school, through all the you know, activities and so on, was within that pillar. Now, so the pillars usually are divided by traditional privileges, right? Religion, ethnicity. But in this case, uh, in, 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 in Eastern Europe, the, the pillars in Poland are politically, political, right? There are constructed political cleavages. People don't talk to one another. I mean, now I don't need to explain this to you, right? You have the members of your family who voted for Trump and you cannot have a conversation with them or you can talk about the weather because the moment this comes to politics, this is like blood bus, right? Uh, so Poland has divided families, uh, uh, people who don't talk to one another. Those divisions are so deep. Uh, they believe everything Kaczynski says and others you know, condemn everything he says, right? Very familiar, right? Look at CNN and <laughs> Fox News, right? So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know why you feel uncomfortable. There's multiple pillars doesn't mean there's multiple civil societies. It's just conceptually, these pillars are related to each other, including in Lebanon. 
the sex all depend on each other. They trade as like a caste society in many ways. Occupationally, they're dependent on each other. So it's just that. They're in one civil society, organized around pillars. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a question of, of, of how you so describe it's very it. Important. Right? If you posit them as all separate societies, then you really do need civil war. Well, in the, in, in the extreme cases, this ends up in civil war. And in Lebanon, you know, it happened a couple of times, right? Uh, but of course, you know, the problem, I mean, diagnosis of the situation is the one story, right? But the problem now facing Poland and many other countries is, okay, so what are we going to do about this, right? When people don't talk to one another, they have their own media, they have their own television stations, they have their own political parties and so on. How can you bridge those differences to recover the same you know, uh, democratic community. Uh, and this is the most important discussion now uh, going on in Poland. Right? How to make people talk to one another. Right? Uh, the idea, many ideas, decentralized completely, so, you know, people have to really have the local decisions uh, based on uh, conversation across this, but you know the peace government doesn't want to decentralize. They want to centralize everything, right? So you know that's that's the difficult moment, and uh, and I think you know you can do something like you know Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, uh, building a bridging organizations which supposed to be over the the cleavages, uh, but uh, in that case it didn't work. Uh, at all. Uh, so I think this is the biggest challenge for, for people who are interested in applied uh, uh, political science, right? How to, how to undo political polarization. And this country is going to face exactly the same problem. How to undo political polarization and those kind of very divided civil societies. Uh, just a short question about uh, this imperial past, because uh, you didn't mention, I mean, it was a brilliant uh, presentation, but you didn't mention that in Poland and in Hungary, this imperial past is really crucial for this kind of, uh, I mean, parties or just for this, uh, for the half of the society. Because Poland uh, uh, has an imperial past and Hungary also, Austro-Hungarian Empire and so on. So, uh, and uh, it plays kind of role in, in, in current situation. Thank you. Well, I mean, you know, I, I uh, don't want to go back uh, so far, but I think the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century experience uh, is a very critical one, right? So Trianon Treaty uh, is that moment uh, in, in which, uh, you know, if you ask any Hungarian whether it's on the right or on, on the left, what's the biggest tragedy in the history of Hungary, they all will say this, right? It's Trianon. Uh, so it's very easy to manipulate and it's very easy to make this a, 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 a very uh, defining issue which can kind of mobilize people uh, uh, in, um, you know, increasing their ethnic and, and national uh, uh, attachments and so on. In Poland, I don't think it's uh, the imperial past which uh, plays an important role, but but really turn of the century uh, experience, the, the the emergence of the of the Polish ethnic uh, nationalism uh, uh, at the time, and the, the debate between the Moski and and Piłsudski is probably in the, in the heart of it, right? So you know, peace is is, uh, is really trying to um, uh, you know follow. That that tradition. I mean, you think about you think about Kaczynski. I, I mean, you know, Radek Sikorski once, uh, the former Polish uh, 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 foreign minister, uh, had this beautiful line saying, "Well, you know, okay, so here is the leader of the country." Uh, who doesn't speak any languages, um, <coughs> never read any foreign newspaper, never saw any foreign television program. He never travels uh, uh, because he, you know, was once abroad when he was a prime minister for a short period of time. Um, he doesn't own the car. Uh, he doesn't own the bank account. And he lives alone with his cat. Now, this man is claiming that he knows where the future of Poland is. Right, and the future of Poland is the 1920s and 1930s. Right, 
so, you know, it's quite amazing that in, in modern world uh, you can have that kind of leaders uh, uh, who are emerging in that way and claiming, uh, 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 you know, that they know where the nation should go. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, thank you so much for an excellent discussion and an excellent talk. Uh, please join me again in giving a big round of applause.